Hello, everybody. I am uh, Paul Copo. I am a French uh, hematologist in uh, Paris at uh, Saint Antoine Hospital and uh, Pierre and Marie Curie University. And I lead the French Reference Center for the Management of Thrombotic uh, Microangiopathies. Today, I will uh, talk about the diagnosis and the management of acquired thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, or TTP. As a reminder, the pathophysiology of TTP is based on a severe deficiency in ADAMS13, the enzyme that cleaves the large von Willebrand factor multimers into lower, less adhesive VWF multimers. And in TTP, uh, there is a severe deficiency in ADAMS13 uh, related to, in most cases, antibodies directed against the enzyme or more rarely, this uh, deficiency results from BLL mutations of the encoding gene. The severe adamsotin deficiency leads to the accumulation in plasma of large VWF multimers that are hyper-adhesive towards platelets. And this leads to the formation of microthrombi in the microcirculation of almost all organs. And in the absence of adaptive treatment, patients uh, die in almost all cases. So on the basis of these statements regarding treatment, uh, regarding uh, pathophysiology, the treatment of TTP consists in replenishing uh, adam levels to saturate the antibodies against uh, adam and to cleave the large VWF multimers. And this is achieved by bringing to the patient large volumes of plasma through a daily plasma exchange that uh, allow bringing to the patient uh, exogenous ADAM-13. The second strategy is immunomodulation. As these patients have antibodies directed against ADAM-13, we need to stop the production of these antibodies by the immune system. So that we can be here more or less selective we can specifically target B cells with rituximab, or we can target T cells with cyclosporin A. More recently, there was an attempt to target directly plasma cells with bortezomib. And there are also, as you know, other immunosuppressors such as corticosteroids, cyclophosphamides, uh, splenectomy, vincristine, and so on. And the third, more recent strategy consists in inhibiting the interaction between platelets and VWF. And this has been achieved with the use of an inhibitor of this interaction, the capacizumab. So this is the traditional, the historical treatment of autoimmune uh, TTP. The standard treatment uh, is based on the association of daily plasma exchange in emergency, as soon as the diagnosis of TTP is made or even highly suspected, and daily plasma exchange are usually associated with steroids, although the level of proof for the efficacy of steroids is lower. So this association of daily plasma exchange and steroids has been the, the core treatment of immune TTP for years, and this uh, regimen has been set up in the early 90s uh, in these two, uh, it has been published in these two works and the same issue of the New England Journal of Medicine in 1991. So with this regimen associating daily plasma exchange and steroids, the prognosis of the disease was outstandingly improved as remission and survival rates uh, shifted from almost zero before the systematic use of this regimen to now more than 85%. So this has been, again, an outstanding uh, improvement in the prognosis of disease. However, some uh, unmet needs are still present for the management of this uh, disease. First, patients may experience, uh, during the standard treatment, episodes uh, called as exacerbation. Exacerbation is a worsening of platelet counts or clinical features during the standard treatment or before durable platelet count recovery. And it is a frequent event 
as it may occur in up to 50% of patients. A uh, more uh, a rarer outcome is refractoriness. Refractoriness means no significant response to uh, treatment, uh, and more specifically, no doubling in platelet count after four full days of standard treatment. This event is rather, it occurs in uh, around 10% of patients. And these two uh, scenarios, exacerbations and refractoriness, are termed uh, suboptimal responses to standard treatment, and they translate uh, in a higher risk of death, as well as in uh, treatment in general, and more specifically, plasma exchange related complications that may occur in up to 28% of cases. So the question was, at the time the disease was becoming a disease of good prognosis, how to improve these results? So it's in this context that immunosuppressors and especially rituximab started to be evaluated in this disease. So rituximab was used first as a salvage therapy in those patients with a suboptimal response to standard treatment in TTP. So patients with an exacerbation or patients with a refractory disease. And the main results with the use of rituximab were first, and this was a good news, uh, the fact that rituximab allows shortening the time to platelet count recovery. As you can see in the left part of the slide, up to 23% of patients needed more than one month of daily plasma exchange until achieving durable complete remission. With the use of rituximab, we now do not see any more patients that need more than three to four weeks of daily plasma exchange until complete remission achievement. So with the use of rituximab, we could limit the duration of daily plasma exchange treatment. The bad news is that rituximab is not efficient in real time, immediately. As you can see in the right uh, uh, part of the slide, you can see a typical patient who was refractory to standard treatment. So he was treated with rituximab but nevertheless, despite the use of rituximab, as you can see, he remained almost three weeks uh, with a severe thrombocytopenia, so with an ongoing TTP before recovering uh, a normal platelet count. And from our experience, as well as uh, from the experience of other groups, the mean time to platelet count recovery after the first rituximab infusion is of 12 days, so almost two weeks. So during this period of time of two weeks, the, everything can still occur, including death. So there was a need to find new compounds able to protect better the patients during this period of time during which rituximab was not efficient. Nevertheless, the results were quite encouraging regarding the use of rituximab, and this pushed uh, practitioners to use it uh, not only as a salvage therapy, but also frontline. So uh, on this uh, uh, way, there was a risk, of course, to other treat some patients who uh, would have recovered without the use of uh, rituximab. But however, an important point is that rituximab made at the acute phase of the disease is able to protect patients remarkably from one to two year relapses. So even if rituximab did not profoundly change survival and refractoriness at the acute phase because it works only after two weeks, it remarkably protects patients from one to two years relapses. And from this observation, you can see here, you can see here that those patients in pink here who received rituximab at the acute phase of the disease do not relapse during almost two years in this study. However, thereafter, if nothing is done, relapses may occur after this period of two years. On the opposite, you can see here the, the blue curve that patients who do not receive rituximab at the acute phase of the disease relapse much more earlier typically as soon as the disease is controlled because 
adamstatin activity remains undetectable in those patients who are otherwise in clinical remission. So now you have to keep in mind that after the acute phase of the disease, when patients have recovered clinically from the disease, 40% of them remain with an undetectable adamstatin activity uh, when rituximab is not used. Okay? And among these 40% of patients who remain with an undetectable adamstatin activity, 40 other percents may relapse during the first year. So from this data, you can calculate the number of patients needed to treat to normalize adamstatin activity. And this number is 1.5. So this means that you need to treat 15 patients at the acute phase of the disease with rituximab to be efficient in 10. So this means to normalize adamstatin activity in 10. So this means that in the five remaining patients, rituximab is inefficient because there are some cases of refractoriness to rituximab or rituximab is ineffective because patients would have normalized adamstatin activity without rituximab. So 15 to be efficient in 10 is a quite good ratio when you consider the severity of a relapse in the such a severe disease, okay? So the, the trend uh, nowadays is to uh, suggest that rituximab should be used in these patients frontline in association to the endoplasmic exchange and steroids. This is an illustrative uh, patient who shows quite nicely the fact that despite the standard treatment and even despite the use of rituximab, the story can be uh, uh, still uh, puzzling. You can see that these patients had a typical uh, diagnosis of TTP at this time. So he had severe thrombocytopenia, he had a cerebral involvement, he had an agitation, uh, he had a build uh, renal involvement. So the French score was at two. So this means that uh, he had a very high probability to have a severe acquired adamstatin deficiency. And indeed, we showed some days later that he did have a severe adamstatin deficiency. We started in emergency deniplasmic chain and steroids, and you can see that he improved nicely peptide count quite rapidly, but he experienced an exacerbation and he remained many, let's say, weeks thrombocytopenic until he improved uh, peptide count more durably. And this patient had a course of rituximab, four infusions of rituximab. And nevertheless, you can see, uh, regarding to what I told you uh, previously, rituximab was not efficient immediately. And the patient, again, remained more than two weeks with a severe thrombocytopenia before improving his condition. So again, we do need, in this disease, a compound able to protect patients until rituximab is efficient. This is the flowchart of uh, Hercules uh, trial. This uh, international trial includes uh, 149 patients and 145 of them were randomized. And 73 patients were treated with the standard treatment and placebo, whereas 71 patients were treated with the standard treatment and capacizumab. And here is the primary endpoint, which is the time to first platelet count recovery. And these data are the integrated data from Titan and Hercules. You can see here that in the black continuous curve that patients in the capacizumab group improved and normalized platelet count faster than patients who receive the placebo. This was a significant uh, difference, and this result is important because it shows that patients who received capacizumab were less exposed to thrombocytopenia, and patients with TTP die during this famous period of thrombocytopenia. So less exposure to thrombocytopenia means less exposure to death. And more interestingly, the streaking difference between the two curves was particularly obvious 
at the very beginning of the management. You can see here that the difference between the two curves is stringent between day three and day 14, 15. And if you remember well, this period of time from day two, three to day 14, 15 corresponds to the period of time during which rituximab is not efficient. So this is very interesting because it means that capacizumab may protect patients and prevent refractoriness, exacerbations, and an unfavorable uh, outcome on these patients until rituximab improves adamsutin activity. So this translates on those secondary uh, outcomes. You can see that in those patients who received capacizumab, no death was observed versus four cases of death in the two placebo groups. Exacerbations uh, strikingly were rare in the, those patients who received capacizumab, only six cases uh, on these groups, which represents 5.6% versus almost 40% in the placebo groups. And similarly, there was no case of refractoriness in the capacizumab groups versus seven cases, 6.3% of cases of refractoriness in the placebo groups. And this difference was significant. From these very interesting results that show that capacizumab is able to prevent unfavorable outcomes at the acute phase of the disease, France was one of the first countries to have uh, available uh, capacizumab through an early access program. So during this early access program period, we set up a national recommendation to treat patients on our country homogeneously with the standard treatment and capacizumab uh, in line with the uh, Hercules protocol. So at the beginning, patients with a TMA syndrome had to have features of TTP, so a severe thrombocytopenia and a mild renal involvement, so a French score of ideally two. If the French score was of one, it was recommended to wait for adamsutin activity at day two or three, sometimes day five, to start the, the, the targeted therapies, especially rituximab. But on those patients with typical features of TTP, this triplet treatment, daily plasma exchange, immunosuppression with steroids and rituximab, and capacizumab could be started. And capacizumab was pursued until the end of daily plasma exchange, and then for usually 30 days following the last plasma exchange session. And interestingly, we also measured adamsutin activity weekly after the last plasma exchange session. So these are the clinical features of the patients we treated with such regimen, we call the CAPLAVI. Patients were recruited from September 2018, the time from which the early access program started, to uh, last December, and we could recruit 90 patients. You can see here the clinical features of those patients, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, table is to show you that these, the feature of these patients were comparable to those of uh, epidemiological studies. So these patients are clearly representative of TTP population in real life. Of note, we, with our score, with the use of our score, we had six diagnostic errors, which included two cases of shigatoxin associated HOS and one case of B12 vitamin deficiency. So these patients had injection of capacizumab. They have two to three uh, daily plasma exchange. Uh, some of them even had rituximab, but nevertheless, the uh, outcome was uh, rapidly favorable once the correct diagnosis was made. Or not as well, 12 other patients were treated with capacizumab, but with a different regimen than this one, so they were not considered uh, furthermore here. These are the other uh, clinical features of, of, on admission on these patients. 
patients had typically a B-cytopenia, LDH level wa was clearly increased, about uh, uh, actually nine times the upper normal value. Serum creatinine was, of course, midly increased. All patients had antibody against the enzyme. And you can see here that almost all patients had steroids, all had rituximab, and most of the patients had rituximab frontline before they fight. So this means that the clinical score, the French score, was accurate to predict a severe adaptive deficiency. And in the end, quite a few number of patients had to wait by day three to five to have the final adapsetine results. And this is the number of days of treatment with a keplacizumab after the last plasma exchange session. And you can see that in patients which treated with a mean of 33 days with keplacizumab after the last plasma exchange session. So again, there was a, a, a good compliance from practitioners to the therapeutic regimen. So these are the outcomes of patients. Those patients with, treated with capacitumab were compared to a historical cohort of 220 patients recruited from our registry between 2015 and 2018. Of course, the clinical features on presentation between the two groups were strictly comparable. And regarding the outcome, you can see that Regarding the primary outcome, which was a composite of death and refractoriness, only two patients in the Kaplasizumab group experienced such outcome. So one patient died from TTP. This was a, a, a patient in the elderly, an 83-year-old woman who had a cardiac involvement of her TTP, no cerebral involvement. So she formally improved her condition but on day nine of the treatment, she experienced an exacerbation of the disease and she suddenly died probably from a pulmonary embolism, although no autopsy was made. The second patient had a mild, only a mild uh, refractory disease, but actually this did not need to intensify the initial treatment. And with the continuation of daily plasma change, immunosuppression and capacizumab, in the end, he normalized his condition. So this was more than a refractory disease, a slow response to the, the treatment. Here, you can keep in mind that 12% uh, of patients experience such primary outcome. And the difference is, of course, highly significant. Regarding the secondary outcomes, only three patients in the Kepacizumab group experienced an exacerbation versus 44% so the difference is streaking uh, in the historical group. The median time to durable platelet count recovery was seven days in the Kaplan-Sizumab group versus almost 14 days in the historical group. And as a result, the number of daily plasma exchange sessions was six in the Kaplan-Sizumab group versus 13 in the historical group. And the volume of plasma was 272 milliliter per kilogram in the capacitivement group versus three-fold uh, more in the historical group. And the one-year relapse here was one patient relapsed in the capacitivement group versus 18, 8% in the historical group. And interestingly, the median time to uh, adamsetin activity improvement as defined by an activity over 20% was 33 days. This is the detail of Adam Stettin improvement throughout the time after the last plasma exchange session. The data were available from 85 patients and you can see that from these 85 patients, nine improved Adam Stettin activity so an activity more than 20%, as soon as seven days after the last plasma exchange session, so nine patients on this scenario, 18 patients improved adamsetin activity two weeks after the last plasma exchange session, 
and so on at day 21, three weeks after the last uh, breast medicine session, 40 patients improve the enzyme activity. Four weeks after, seven patients improve. At day 35, 40 patients improve. And there are some patients, or many patients, improve the enzyme activity later. And here, interestingly, 10 patients out of 85 improved adamsetine activity after day 56. At least in theory, Keplacizumab had to be pursued uh, uh, during all this time in those patients until they at least improved adamsetine activity over 20%. Regarding tolerance, we observed uh, 46 patients with at least one reported adverse event attributed to kepacizumab. So this represents 50% uh, of patients. Interestingly, we observed uh, thrombocytosis in 18 cases. Thrombocytosis range from uh, 500,000 platelets to 900,000 in one case. Patients experience some uh, bleeding, especially epistaxis in nine cases, gingival bleeding in seven cases, bruises in seven cases as well, hematomas, rectoragia, metroragia, and so on. We experience some cases of more severe bleeding, one case of hemorrhagic shock. Uh, this patient was an uh, elderly patient who was taking clopidogrel and he had a uh, chronic renal failure. And during uh, uh, the post plasma exchange period, he was uh, hospitalized again while he was in clinical remission uh, of his TTP for a shock and a severe anemia. And uh, we diagnosed digestive uh, bleeding. And uh, we, of course, stopped uh, Keplacizumab. Uh, while the activity, uh, Adam's activity was still undetectable, but nevertheless, the outcome was favorable with uh, symptomatic measures, red blood cell transfusion. Uh, again, we stopped Kleplacizumab. We didn't need to infuse uh, VWF concentrates, and uh, fortunately, Adam's activity improved in the following week. This is an uh, illustrative case of a 45 year old woman. This is actually the very first patient we treated with uh, this Kaplavi regimen in France. So this uh, woman was uh, interesting and impressive for us because this woman had a typical form of TTP on diagnosis. The French score was of two. So again, this means that thrombocytopenia was severe and renal involvement was mild. And this patient had a severe presentation of the disease because she had a CNS involvement and a heart involvement. She was immediately treated with uh, the triplet treatment with daily plasma exchange, immunosuppression, and capacizumab from day one because, again, the picture of the disease was typical. And as you can see in this slide, you can see that despite the severity of the disease, and this woman was typically exposed to uh, exacerbations and refractoriness and even death. Well, you can see that with this treatment, platelet count increased very rapidly and durably with no exacerbation at all, despite, again, the severity of the disease. And similarly, the LDH level dramatically decreased very rapidly after the first days of treatment and LDF remained uh, uh, durably normal thereafter. Adam's certain activity improved uh, quite uh, rapidly at uh, day uh, 13 of the management. So this corresponds to uh, seven days after the last plasma exchange session. And one week later, Adam's certain activity was at the 25%. So we took the freedom, let's say, to stop Keplacizumab because we consider that 27% of adaptogen activity was protective enough to avoid further uh, features of TTP. And now this patient, after now it is exactly two years of follow-up, uh, she's alive and well. As a conclusion of uh, our uh, experience in the use of uh, Keplacizumab, we confirmed in our Kaplan study the data from the Hercules trial 
since we observed very few severe outcomes, including death and refractoriness, we had very few exacerbations, only 4%, and they were minor. We did not need to intensify the treatment versus usually 40, 50%. And we observed a fast and sustained response to treatment with a, a substantial decrease in the number of plasma exchange and plasma volumes by two to three fold. We had some adverse events in regard with the mechanism of action of the drug, as this drug provides a von Willebrand disease of type 2M. And we emphasize it from our results that we should have, be cautious with the use of capacizumab in the elderly, especially those patients who are frail and polymedicated. And this is an underestimated aspect from clinical trials. So in other words, this needs to be uh, more accurately addressed in the future. It's likely that uh, uh, Keplasizumab is a bit more difficult to, to use uh, in the elderly population. The compliance of practitioners to Keplavin regimen was uh, good, which should uh, allow now a rapid and efficient analysis of real life data to increase our experience on the use of uh, this compound. And now the, the perspectives from these works are to develop a more personalized treatment with capacizumab. So the question is, could capacizumab be stopped as soon as adapsetin activity is over 20%? So as you have seen uh, for many patients between day 14 and day 35. So in other words, it may be useless to propose a flat duration of treatment of 30 days and it's likely that this duration of treatment of keplacizumab after the last plasma exchange session could depend on adamstein activity measured weekly. So this would allow to, to, to spare some uh, substantial injections of uh, keplacizumab. So regarding the forthcoming challenges and uh, perspective, uh, I would like first to share with you a last uh, clinical experience. This is the story of a 45-year-old uh, woman who was uh, less lucky than the previous one. This patient experienced uh, some digestive uh, troubles one day in the evening. She had nausea with epigastric pain following a meal of muscles the day before. And the day after, she uh, started to have a vomiting and uh, uh, an episode of uh, hematemesis. She had uh, jaundice as well, so she rapidly consulted her GP. And on February 17, in the morning, so two days after the first uh, manifestations, an abdominal ultrasound sonography uh, was normal, but blood cell count disclosed a severe thrombocytopenia and an anemia. She was immediately referred by her general practitioner to the local hospital in emergency. The thrombocytopenia was confirmed, and given the severity of the thrombocytopenia and uh, given the absence of, let's say, organ failure, the diagnosis of autoimmune thrombocytopenia was retained. So the patient was treated with steroids. Uh, she was quite reassured about the prognosis of her condition. And uh, some uh, hours later in the night at 4 a.m., the biologist phoned to the clinicians and said to them, be careful, I can see some schistocytes in the blood smear. Consider revisiting the diagnosis uh, for the diagnosis of TCP. And the answer of the clinicians was, there's no organ involvement, no organ failure, only cytopenias. So we believe the diagnosis of autoimmune cytopenia is the good one. Unfortunately, some hours later, at the early morning, the patient presented a sudden death by cardiorespiratory arrest. And uh, we could uh, find uh, an adequate of serum that had been sampled uh, at the arrival of patients at the emergency department. And we measured adapted activity, which was undetectable with a high titer of uh, antibodies directed against the enzyme. So the diagnosis of autoimmune TTP was made, unfortunately, post-mortem. And uh, I have to add that given the sudden death of this patient, uh, actually there was an uh, autopsy 
and uh, the diagnosis of TTP was made on the autopsy post-mortem. So as you can see, learning by experience can be painful, but uh, it's still more painful not to learn from experience. And at this time, to make clinicians aware of TTP diagnosis remains one of the most important issues because it is likely that a substantial number of TTP patients still die before diagnosis. Now we have the ability to treat patients very efficiently with efficient agents such as plasma exchange, immunosuppression, capacizumab. We feel that there is less and less uh, unfavorable conditions of the disease with such treatment. We may even imagine that we could reach almost uh, zero death on this disease with uh, the new regimens we start to use. But as long as the patient is not in the circle of the management, we cannot do anything for him. And this patient may die from the disease. So this is why it is mandatory to think much more about this disease than we do now. Last but not the least, this is a new hope we, we still have, the recombinant form of adam statin, And this is a, a hope for us because we believe this agent could replace uh, plasma exchange. So this recombinant protein was so far uh, evaluated on a phase one uh, study. And this phase one recruited 15 patients who were treated with a single infusion of such enzyme. So these uh, 15 patients were split on three groups of five patients and each of the three groups of five patients receive a single infusion of a different dose of the recombinant protein. And the main results are that the recombinant protein is safe and well tolerated as no serious adverse events were recorded, especially no immunogenicity was observed. Uh, the half-life of the recombinant protein is comparable to the half-life of the wild-type protein. And last, it was observed that those patients who had a mild thrombocytopenia and a mild increase in the, the LDH level improve these uh, values after the injection of the recombinant protein. Now, I have to say that this recombinant protein was evaluated on those 15 patients who had a congenital form of TTP. Now, the enzyme is evaluated on patients with a congenital TTP on a phase three trial, as well as in patients with an autoimmune form of the disease in association with uh, plasma exchange. So the results are expected in the following years. And of course, the hope is to again, replace plasma and plasma exchange with uh, this enzyme. So in conclusion, we suggest that this approach consisting in treating patients with ADAM13 supplementation with daily plasma exchange, and soon, let's hope, a recombinant ADAM13, immunosuppression with corticosteroids and rituximab, and capacizumab that prevents the interaction between platelets and VWF. This regimen, by addressing the three aspects of the pathophysiology of the disease, should substantially improve the prognosis of autoimmune TTP. So now we are, as you have seen, moving towards more precision medicine to improve TTP prognosis. So again, death rate of acute TTP actually scarcely changed for more than 20 years because again, rituximab cannot be efficient in real time. So uh, the hope is that with the use of capacizumab and soon with the recombinant uh, form of adam we should improve the mortality of the disease and uh, prevent uh, the usual unfavorable outcomes. Very interestingly, these new therapies, capacizumab, the recombinant form of adam and the targeted therapies regarding immunosuppression, such as rituximab, the new therapies were derived from a better understanding of TTP pathophysiology, reflecting a shift from empiricism to targeted therapies. So TTP is therefore entering a new area of diagnostic and personalized medicine. 
And this is to thank all my colleagues who work with me daily on this topic in France and throughout the world. Thank you for your attention.